believe. Amen. Good morning, church. Man, was that not incredible a while ago? I tell you, you know, so many times we say things about uh, technology and uh, social media, uh, but you know, uh, one of the blessings of it is what we just experienced. I tell you, that that was amazing. And uh, Marcy, we celebrate with you and your family, with uh, Ellery. I mean, I have goosebumps just all over me right now. And if you like, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 27 for just a moment. Um, you know, we're living in a time right now that what our world needs desperately is hope. Uh, it just seems like there's so much darkness, there's so much negativity, there's so much bad stuff going on, so many struggles with, with so many areas of our life. And, you know, before Ellery was baptized, uh, the gentleman asked her, the brother asked her, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And in essence, he was asking her, do you believe that, that He is who He says that He is? Do you believe that He is the Messiah? And Ellery answered, uh, with a, a very affirmative, yes, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But do you realize on the very first Easter morning, this morning, almost 2,000 years ago, that there was not a single Jesus follower that believed that Jesus had resurrected. Not a single one of them. And we'll see that in just a moment. And I started thinking back to Friday, what we call today Good Friday. I saw someone ask the question or ask the question whenever they were thinking about what happened. How can it be good? I mean, when you stop and you think about what Jesus went through on Friday, it, it was horrific beyond anything that we could ever imagine as they literally whipped and beat God. Because we can look back. We can see that they literally whipped God to a pulp. This one that we believe in. And then when you look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus cried out as He was near the end of His life as a human being on this earth. He cried out, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabathani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then John states in John chapter 19, right after Jesus said and asked God and cried out on that cross as he was dying, why have you abandoned me? John states that Jesus in his final words, breathing his last breath, said, it is finished. It is finished. It's over. And what the people heard in Jesus' day was that the Messiah was dead. It's over. I mean, these 12, can you imagine the 12 apostles, the ones, they had left everything to follow Jesus. You remember, we talked about that in uh, like two or three weeks ago in that little mini-series that we did, did being an authentic Jesus follower, what it means to be an authentic Jesus follower, and how Jesus called those first disciples to leave everything in order to follow Him, and they did that. They left their jobs, they left their homes, they left their families, they left everything that they were familiar with to follow Jesus. And now, they heard him say, God, God abandoned them. 
They misunderstood what he was saying. And then he said, it's, it's over? You see, the reason, and you can turn to John chapter 6 for just a moment. The reason that these first apostles were following Jesus, it wasn't about his teaching. It wasn't the parables that he told. It wasn't the stories that he told. It wasn't that he was such a great teacher. It wasn't about his teaching. It wasn't about his miracles. That's, that wasn't the reason that this, the first apostles were following Jesus. The reason that they were following Jesus was because of who they thought and believed that he was. You remember in John chapter 6, we talked about this scripture, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, where, uh, where there were several thousand people that were following Jesus, and, and it became time to eat, and so uh, Jesus said, okay, feed them. And, and that's when the apostles came up to Jesus and said, what are you talking about? Feed them. There's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, and all we have is two fish and five loaves of bread. And so Jesus... He, he, he's teaching them. He's showing them. And, and trying to get them to understand who He is. In this situation, who He is and trusting Him that no matter how things look at the moment, it's not that way. There is nothing impossible with our God. Amen, church? There's nothing impossible with God. And that's what Jesus was trying to show them in this situation. Two fish, five loaves of bread, 5,000 men that are, that, are, that are starving, along with the women and children, and we're supposed to feed them with this? Who is this? that's telling us this. And do we trust Him? Because there's some of us right now today that we feel like that we are there. We feel like right now at this moment that we do not know if we can take another breath. We don't know if we can continue on. And we're beginning to question, who is this? Can I put my faith in Him? Can I put my trust in Him? And if you remember, Jesus then, he started talking to the crowd because he knew that, that the next day they were just following him for a free meal. And Jesus knew that and he told them that. And then he started teaching them because he wanted to teach them, you know what, it's more than just physical food that you're eating. I want to give you spiritual food that will last for an eternity. And so he told them, I am the bread of life. I came down from heaven. And then when you look at John chapter 6, the Bible there tells us, John tells us that there were some in the crowd and they started murmuring. They started thinking, wait a minute. And, and, they, and they shout, what, what are you talking about? You're Jesus. We know who you are. We know your mom. We know your dad. We know where you came from. And so then they started walking away. And in verse 66, the Bible says, John says, at that point, many of his disciples, they turned away and they deserted Jesus. And so then Jesus turned to the 12 and he asked, are you going to leave? And Simon Peter, who was kind of the spokesman of the group, he said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. The reason that they did not turn away from Jesus was because of who they believed that Jesus was. That you 
You're the Holy One of God. Flip forward just a few pages, and you'll see how all this connects in just a moment. But, but you remember the story, uh, John chapter 11. You remember the incident that happened with Lazarus? Most of us remember that incident with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. I mean, here's Jesus. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going for his last time into the city of Jerusalem that we talked about last week from Scripture with Palm Sunday. And when you look at uh, John, he's writing in uh, chapter 11. He, he says Lazarus was, was, was sick. And then, and then he mentions the fact that, that his two sisters, Mary and Martha, that they sent this message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. And then when Jesus, verse 4, when Jesus heard about it, he said, and he's saying to his apostles there, he's saying Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. But it did. But he told them in verse 11, because he waited two days. Two days passed. And in verse 11, he said to his apostles, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought that Jesus meant that Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus has died. And so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come on, let's go see him. Do you see the prelude of what Jesus is wanting to teach them? He's wanting to teach them about resurrection. He's wanting to teach them that things are not always the way that they seem, the way that they appear. And with Jesus, even when things are dead, there is life, there is resurrection. No matter what is going on in your life, Sometimes we feel like that maybe our marriage isn't the best. Sometimes we may feel like that, that our marriage is dead. It seems like it's dead in the water. And so many times we just give up and we just quit and just walk away. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it may need to happen. But no matter what, Jesus can resurrect you out of that situation. So many other situations, it's not as it appears. And so when Jesus gets to Bethany in verse 17, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Lazarus had been dead in the tomb four days. And so in verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet Jesus. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. I.e., what she was really saying to Jesus was, where were you? Where were you? We sent word to you that, that he was very sick. We wanted you to come. We wanted you to be here because we know that you could have kept him alive. But you were silent. You abandoned us. You didn't care anything about us. When we needed you the most, Jesus, you were absent. And again, I feel like many of us at times, we find ourselves there. We cry out to God, and we cry out to God. 
And as we were talking about in our Bible study this morning, we feel like sometimes we don't hear heaven speak. We don't hear God speak. We feel like God is absent. But then when you look at verse 32, then the other sister, Mary, she arrived and she saw Jesus and she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And so then verse 33, when Jesus saw the people that were there and they were weeping with Mary and with Martha, the Bible says this, a deep anger welled up within Jesus. And he was deeply troubled. Think about this. He's, he's standing there and he's watching all of these people crying and mourning and wailing at the death of Lazarus. See, Jesus is getting ready to face this very thing in his life and being put in a tomb, dead. But he has told them that he's going to be resurrected. And so they didn't get it. They have not gotten it. And so they told him, Lord, just, just come and see for yourself. And then verse 35, Jesus wept. And the people that were standing nearby, they said, see how much that he loved him. See how much Jesus loved Lazarus. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have healed Lazarus from dying and kept Lazarus from dying? And Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And he said, roll the stone aside. But Martha, she protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. But they rolled the stone aside, and Jesus looked up to heaven, and he said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all of these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. What is the purpose of the resurrection? Jesus' resurrection. is so that we will know without a shadow of a doubt that God sent Jesus to this planet to deliver us from sin and death and to save us And he said, I, Father, I want them to know and so that you'll believe that you sent me, Father. And so Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes. His face was wrapped in head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. And Lazarus came walking out alive. Do you believe this, church? Or is this some kind of a tale? Is this some kind of a, a, a story of some sort, a fable? And the thing is, there were all of these people there. And they were watching this. And they knew that, that this truly happened. So what does that tell us about resurrection and about our resurrection and about life, the fact that we have life now? Jesus is never absent. Jesus is never AWOL. Mary and Martha, they thought, where were you? We prayed to you. We called out to you to come, but you never came, and he died. 
Have you ever been there? Look at, uh, and we'll finish out with Mark chapter 15. So even after Lazarus and being called from the tomb after four days of being dead, Mark is telling this, this uh, account of Jesus' life and, and history tells us that he got this information from Peter. So he's, he's, he's questioning Peter. He's been asking Peter all about Jesus and he's been recording this and writing all of this down. And, and if you look at verse 15, uh, that's where Jesus uttered his last breath and, and he said that it is finished and, and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There was a Roman officer that was standing there observing all of this and when he saw Jesus die, uh, he said this, was, this man was truly the Son of God. And then there were some women in verse 40 that were there. They were watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. And they had been followers of Jesus, and they had cared for him while he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem. They were also there. And then in verse 42, this all happened on Friday the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. And as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, he took a risk. And he went to Pilate, and he asked Pilate for Jesus' body. And Joseph was, on, was an honored member of the high council, their supreme court. And he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He is waiting, he is watching for the kingdom of God to come, for the Messiah and Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called the Roman officer and asked him if he had died yet. And the officer confirmed that Jesus was dead. So Pilate told Joseph that he could have the body. And Joseph bought a long sheet of linen cloth. And then he took Jesus' body down from the cross and he wrapped it in the cloth and he laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. And then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where Jesus' body was laid. Here's a man of the ruling high council of the Jews, a religious leader, been looking for the Messiah to come, waiting for the kingdom of God to come, thinking Jesus is Him. But he saw Jesus die. And he saw Jesus dead. He saw Jesus, and so he took the body. And, and the reason he bought the linen cloth, and he found the tomb, and he put the stone, it's over. This wasn't him. This man was not the Messiah. And there were no answers from heaven about it. So chapter 16, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, they went out and they purchased burial spices so that they could anoint Jesus' body. Why did they do that? They went out and they bought more spices and they were going to go to the burial place to anoint his body. What they were going to do, because it was uh, the Passover uh, that was coming on Friday, Joseph had to rush and, and get, the bury, uh, get the body in the grave and he did not finish the burial preparation. So what they were going to do is, because they had followed Jesus and they loved Jesus, they were going to finish the burial preparation, but they did not believe that he was going to be resurrected. He's dead. 
Let's finish preparing the body. But very early, on Sunday morning, verse 2, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. And on the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, it had already been rolled away. And when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women, they were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. Their question, according to some of the other gospel writers, about this incident where Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, her question was, what have you done with Jesus? What have you done with his body? Where did you put it? Because I came here to take care of his body and to prepare it for his final burial. But the angel said, He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. And I love this part right here. Be sure that you tell Peter that he has risen from the dead. And you need to go and tell his disciples that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. Go and meet Jesus at Galilee. And be sure that you include Peter. Why? Because the last time that Peter saw Jesus alive on this planet was whenever he was asked, are you a follower of Jesus? And three times Peter said, no. As a matter of fact, I don't even know this man. I have never seen this man. And the last time he actually called down curses on himself to prove to those that were standing around that I am not his follower. That's the last time that Peter saw Jesus alive. Man, what a, what a, what a message for us this morning. Because it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have ever done in your life. It doesn't matter what you did last night. This message of salvation, this message of deliverance, this message of, rev uh, of resurrection is for all of us, for any of us. Have you ever taken the name of Jesus in vain? Oh, I used to all the time. I used the name of Jesus like a curse word, like a cuss word. That's what Peter did. But praise God, when Jesus was resurrected, he said, the angel told him, you go and you tell his followers, including Peter, to go and meet me at Galilee. Can you imagine the relief that Peter felt? Man, I've got goosebumps going all over me right now. Because this is the best news ever, that this message of Jesus and his resurrection today, that we're celebrating today, but we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and we ought to every single day. Amen? He's alive. And no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter if you've even cursed the name of Jesus, Jesus said, I want to meet with you. I want to meet with you. And so in verse 8, the women, they fled from the tomb trembling and bewildered. And they said, they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. And verse 9, after Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. Again, don't, don't miss this. 
The first person that Jesus chose to reveal himself to was a woman, and a woman who, who had been possessed by seven demons. In other words, her life was a mess before she met Jesus. And the first evangelist was a woman. Evangelist just simply means to ring out the good news. And the first person that Jesus chose to reveal himself to was Mary Magdalene, a woman who had had seven demons, a woman whose life had been a mess. And he said, now, I want you to go back and I want you to tell the others what you have just witnessed. Ring this good news out. This message is for all of us. She went to the disciples in verse 10, and they were grieving and they were weeping, and they told them and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they didn't believe her. They didn't believe her. We're talking about his 12 and the other disciples. They didn't believe her. And afterward in verse 12, he appeared in a different form to two of, the, uh, two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem and to the country. And they rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. This is the two men on the road to Emmaus. Remember uh, in, the, in Luke uh, chapter 24, these two followers of Jesus, they're leaving Jerusalem. They are just really just bummed out and they're going back home. And Jesus comes and he starts walking along beside them and they do not even recognize him. And, 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 and Jesus said, hey, what's going on? Why are you looking so downcast? And, and, they, and they say, well, man, you must be the only dude in the whole, on the whole planet that does not know what went on in Jerusalem over these last few days. And Jesus told them and showed them who he was after they got to their house and he sat and he ate with them. What I'm wanting to say to you, friends, is that Jesus, even in our unbelief, he, he wants to come and he wants to eat with us. He wants to commune with us, with you. Don't turn your back on the resurrected Savior. And then still later, verse 14. He appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together, and he rebuked them for their stubbornness and their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Jesus is asking, he's asking, I mean, what else can I do? That's why he was angry at Lazarus, at, at, not at Lazarus, at, at, at his death where, where he was already in the tomb. Jesus was angry because they weren't getting it. They, they, they weren't placing their faith in him. Jesus had been showing them who he was way back in John chapter 6 with that, letting them know who he was and that there is no circumstance, there is no moment that I am absent. Look who I am. I can do the impossible because my God is the God of the impossible. And here, he's angry at his own disciples because they don't even believe those who had seen Jesus with their own eyes resurrected And these should have been the ones that got it first. But here's what he told them in verse 15. And this is our message. And this is our hope. He said, I want you to go into all the world. And I want you to preach this good news to everyone. And anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, will be delivered. This is Jesus. He's telling us 
that we don't sit in this building and just sit here and, and, and sing songs and pray and have scripture and have a sermon and then we just get up and, and we just go about our business. Church, how in the world can we go about our business? When we know that Jesus is resurrected, that Jesus was dead, that he is alive. We should never be able to go back just to our norm, nor, normal lives or the normalcy of, of how we live life. He's telling us that as we go, we need to be telling everybody this good news about Jesus. And you know what I'm finding right now? At this time in our history, I'm finding that people are very receptive, that people, they're searching. Even people that you would never think are searching. If we just have our antennas up, if we're just aware, and, and, and as we listen to people, we've got something to share with them. We've got hope when there's a world that is, that is, that is drowning in hopelessness. And hope isn't like, well, I got my fingers crossed. I hope this turns out. No, that's not the kind of hope. Hope is desire plus expectation. That's what the word literally means. Desire. I desire Jesus. I desire salvation. I desire to be with Him forever. And I expect to, not because I am so good, but because Jesus is so good. And because He is alive. And so even today, man, what a way to, to start off uh, any, any day, right? Witnessing a baptism. Witnessing someone, an Ellery in this case, that we all know, those of us that are old timers here, that, that we know, man, you know what? She just gave her life to Jesus. She just died to herself and said, I want Jesus to live in me and through me. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe in life. And you may be here today. And maybe you've never been baptized. And baptism is a choice that you make. It's not a choice that, that our parents make for us when we're first born. When you look at Jesus and New Testament baptism, he, all the way through the book of Acts, when people heard the good news of Jesus... And why are we baptized? Because Jesus said to be. Jesus said, I want you to go, and I want you to make disciples of all nations, and I want you to baptize them. The number one reason I'm baptized? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said so. And Romans tells us that, that that's the way that, that, we, that we show that we're dying to ourselves. We're going underneath that water, uh, just like Ellery did in that bathtub. Remember when we baptized that guy in the bathtub in Pea Ridge? Man, that was incredible. He couldn't even make it to the baptistry because of his health. He was a cranky old dude. I mean, wasn't he? I mean, the neighbors told us. The neighbors knew that we were going and visiting with them and studying with them and, and talking about Jesus to them. And they go, man, you're just wasting your time. And, and I, I mean, that was, that was our first job, preaching. I don't know if I knew any better. But I like the dude. Philip, right? And when he was baptized, that one neighbor that he said had always, they had always had odds and been at odds and, and Philip was a pain, said, you know what? He has changed. He came and he asked me for forgiveness for all of these years, all of these decades. And then he told his neighbor about Jesus. You can be baptized today. I just happened to catch Tom. I was just walking in the hall, and I knew somebody was back at the baptistry, and I called Tom, and I said, hey, is the baptistry ready? And, and he, he got one little bug out. I don't know. It had all kinds of little legs on it, but we got it out. The water's cold, 
But I want to tell you, if you want to be baptized today, if you want to be baptized right now, all you got to do is just raise your hand right now. If you want to be baptized right now, we will baptize you right now. Or you may say, well, you know what, kind of like Ellery, I'm not for sure what time she called and all of this, but she wanted to be sure that we could get on Zoom and different things. And you may say, well, you know what, I know I'm not a fan of cold water. It takes about two or three hours for that baptistry to heat up, and you can say, hey, uh, I, want, I want to talk with you. Hey, I want to, I'm wanting to be baptized at 3 o'clock today or whatever. I was telling Tom, I said, we need to get back to where we're giving people the opportunity, giving you the opportunity, those on Zoom and those that will be watching later on, uh, on YouTube. You know, the, the awesome thing is, uh, uh, Jennifer Thompson and I, we, we baptized that lady in Wyoming. You remember that? I told you that we baptized her here in Peoria, and she was in Wyoming in her bathtub baptized herself, dunked herself. She wanted me to say some words over her and wanted Jennifer to be able to experience that as well. Because Jesus said, but anyone who refuses to believe, anyone who refuses to put their trust in me will be condemned. And this isn't Jesus saying, okay, it's me or else. If you don't follow me, you're going to be condemned. No. You know, Jesus is just stating a fact. The only way that you and I can be perfect before our God, be holy before God, all the way through Scripture, be holy as I am holy. And the only way that you and I can be holy before a holy God is because of Jesus and His blood and what He did on that Friday. Do you know what he cried out to God? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You know why God abandoned Jesus at that moment? Because he had all of your sins on him. All of your sins on him. All of my sins, all of the sins of the whole world were on Jesus at that point. And a holy God cannot look at all of the filth, all of the garbage, all of the trash that we heaped on Jesus. But Jesus did it because He loves you and because He wants you to be saved. And He's offering you that invitation to come to Him. Put your faith in Him. Trust Him. Be baptized. Be delivered. Begin a new life. And the way that we celebrate that today is with the Lord's Supper, what Jesus did on Friday. But one thing that we need to understand, and go ahead and get your Lord's Supper ready, get your bread out. One of the things about Jesus on, on Friday, if Jesus had not been resurrected today, on that first Sunday, we wouldn't even be talking about Good Friday. We would not even be talking about, or reading about, or excited about, what Jesus did on that cross. We wouldn't even know anything about it because why? If he was dead and remained dead. But see, the resurrection changes everything. It changes everything. And so today, we just want to celebrate you, Jesus. We just want to say thank you for loving us. Thank you for carrying our sin. Thank you that, that you are willing for God to abandon you so that we will never, ever be abandoned by our God. Because you became our sin. You became my sin. And in place of you taking my sin, you gave me, Jesus, you gave us your righteousness. You gave everything that is right about you. You gave that to us. And so today we celebrate that, Jesus. We cannot say it enough. Thank you. And now as you get the fruit of the vine... It's just hard for us to imagine, Jesus, what you went through for us. I never liked being bullied. I always wanted to fight back. 
And probably most of the time, I wouldn't have won. But that's kind of innate in us as human beings. And here you were, Jesus, 100% human, but yet 100% God. And you're on that cross, and, and they have whipped you to a pulp. And, you, and they were mocking you on that cross, saying, man, if you really are who you say you are, just call for angels, and they'll come and get you down. And the thing is, you could have done it. You had all of heaven at your disposal. You could have just obliterated those people that were standing there mocking you and that had beat you. But you didn't. Because you love us. And you poured out your blood to show us that love. And to establish a new covenant with us that it's not about keeping the laws and all the rules and all the rituals, but it's about you, loving you, following you. And when we do that, then we follow all the commandments and everything the prophets had ever said. So Jesus, thank you. And again, Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for your resurrection. Lord, I pray that this will excite us today. I pray, Lord, that this will place hope within each one of us. And Lord, I am praying for any that may be in this assembly today, this gathering today, or on Zoom, or, or on YouTube later from maybe some other part of the world, that if they need to be baptized into you and place their faith in you, that they will do that today while they are still today. In Jesus' name, amen.